You're tuned in to Reimagine 2021, version 11, the number one virtual crypto and blockchain conference. Coming up, our panel of experts break down what makes NFTs so interesting. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to Reimagine 2021 version 11. I'm Roshan Marajkar from Mousefeld. I'll be your host for this event. Very excited to talk about NFTs, DAOs, and what's really happening in the space. With me here today, I have Alexi Fallon, who is the CEO and co-founder of Rareville. Alexi, welcome to the show. Good to see you. Yeah, for sure. And you know, just to start things off, we're here in the historic NFT NYC uh, week. And yeah. you know, just to start off, why do NFTs uh, matter to you personally? Hmm. For me personally, so I have this experience working with um, uh, different visual things and visual content. And I know from before that uh, it's a big part of human beings, like emotions, and they usually like visual things that attached with emotions. So it's um, for me, it, it was pretty clear that um, in crypto, the NFT standard, uh, the just one thing that it contains this uh, media like uh, video or images just makes them much more like engaging rather than other tokens like here's it one is then you have only numbers it's kind of boring so uh yeah that's why i really like this from the very beginning the standard itself and uh, for me it feels like it should be lots of different applications digital art has been around a long time it's not new but what hasn't been possible is for a digital artist to be able to sell and have people collect their art the way things would uh, within the 2D traditional world. And so with NFTs now, we have an amazing system where now there's evidence to where things go on the internet, where things stay on the blockchain. And so for, I think the best thing that's happened is for these digital artists who could only make a living as you know animators, graphic designers, film directors, to now be able to be identified as an artist and also make a living as artists. And that is the greatest thing about NFTs to me, the level of access that it gives to both new and upcoming artists and also original uh, artists looking to create new things. Why do NFTs matter to me? That's an excellent question. I don't view NFTs simply as JPEGs that we buy and sell back and forth. I view NFTs as us using blockchain technology to create something basically liquid intellectual property, the ability to put your copyright on chain and then be able to say, I own this piece of artwork and I can buy and I can sell it and I can fractionalize it and I can create smart programming behind that to be able to generate revenue and royalties in perpetuity. That power is massive and it's revolutionary and it will change the nature of the creator industry to be able to harness this perpetuity of revenue streams. So that's why NFTs matter to me. Oh, wow. Um, I mean, where do you begin, right? It's such a radical new technology that is, you know, is able to create digital scarcity, um, digital bearer properties. Uh, there are so many use cases that can be solved using NFTs. Uh, of course, today we are seeing digital goods um, use cases in gaming, use cases in the metaverse. Um, you know, uh, f it's been a long time coming in how you think about the maturation of um, digital worlds, um, augmented reality, VR, all of this ties in quite nicely with the uh, software protocol layer that can then um, reinforce digital scarcity. So I think, you know, it's still very early stage, but you're going to see a lot um, of, of, of new features, new capabilities being developed around that. If you take a step back and look outside of the digital universe, the metaverse and gaming, there's also a bunch of capabilities in 
uh, financial markets or identity um, that is yet to be solved at an industry-wide level and can have applications using NFT technology. I think NFTs are really important because they allow true ownership of digital assets, uh, something that uh, historically we've never been able to do in a digital way. Um, you know, in, in the past we've had centralized servers that allow people to hold uh, you know, skins for a game, or you go to your bank and you see that you've got a, a title for your home. Um, but it's all stored centrally, and there's never really been a way previously for someone to truly own uh, something digital in the cloud, and that ownership is, uh, is really important. I think with NFTs, one of the things that's been fascinating is watching the whole sector grow. Um, I remember the, f the early NFTs that I was interacting with uh, was by Dapper Labs, the Crypto Kitties project. And I remember, I think it was in the winter time, and when the NFT world started to uh, kind of come out of the woodworks, then all of a sudden the Ethereum blockchain was all clogged up, and ev the whole joke of, of the town, I guess, at the time was saying, hey, all these cats are clogging up the network. And that was really what triggered me to say, okay, well, what, why, do the, why are these cats clogging up this, this financial network? Why does this matter? Then dug a little deeper, realized there were unique assets that were verifiable by the technology that I, they, that I really understood pretty well, especially from the decentralized finance background. And then from there, really started to realize, oh, well, you could be a creator, you could be some sort of artist, maybe it's, it's um, visual art, or it could, could be also uh, actually audio as well. And then that kind of opportunity opened up especially more because I have a creative background as well. So kind of that was the aha moment for me. First it was cats, and then it was actual creatives. And then even beyond that, some of the, the things I've learned from finance, you can kind of understand, all right, well maybe there are some, what I call maybe like not as sexy applications, but still could revolutionize certain industries, especially as it relates to those that require single source of truths for people, especially like maybe grants programs, for example, or uh, property rights is another good industry to, to kind of reference. At least for someone like myself, um, I'm, I was a motion graphics artist for the last like 10 years. Um, and basically what this presents to like people in my fields, people who work for studios, digital artists, creators, I guess everywhere, is it presents another avenue for income, another option, um, whether that's like a career option or like, you know, something to pay the bills. Um, and so typically as like a motion graphics artist, you either go the studio route or you become an independent contractor uh, and kind of have your own clients, be a little more entrepreneurial. Um, and if you wanted to do your own art, there wasn't a lot of ways to really make a lot of money doing it unless you're like doing it for so long that you've built up a massive audience. Um, you know, Beeple's a perfect example of this, but even he wasn't monetizing like his everydays and the work he was making every day. Um, and so basically NFTs create a way for us to kind of enter into this fine art realm where our art is actually collectible, verifiable, authentic. Um, and it makes a lot of sense in the digital space um, and like where technology is moving. Um, so I think that's what's exciting me the most, like seeing friends, seeing colleagues have this alternate path, like not have to work for clients, like be able to like express themselves, make their own art. Um, and so to me, that is like the most exciting followed up by the, the potential for NFTs as like fundraising vehicles and ways to like engage with audiences and brands and fans. When I look at NFTs, right, it, it sort of goes back to um, something a bit more fundamental as, as a human. So I like to imagine if I had all the wealth in the world and I was, uh, you know, basically in, in, had a lot of wealth, but I was living alone and I was isolated and I couldn't interact with people. What would that mean? Like, would that be meaningful? Would I be happy, right? Um, and the answer for me is no. So in society, we tend to have these, um, these ways of showing our status of who we are and we represent ourselves by the way we dress, by the things that we have, like the cars, the, the watches, and all of that, right? So if you look at the social media platforms today, like Instagram, um, you'll see people showing their status via travels that they're doing, the food they're eating, the clothes and, and all this kind of like, you know, luxury items that they have. And for the first time with NFTs, you have a digital native way of showing your status. And that to me is, is kind of interesting and really exciting. But that is just a starting point. 
right? And I think with NFTs, we expect so much more creativity to come out of this and a lot of utility and use cases, uh, which, which me personally, I'm the most excited about. So, about. so there's definitely an element of art to it, which, uh, which would be great, but I'm, I'm not an artist. So, you know, for me, while that's great and I appreciate that, I see it, I see it having a lot of use cases outside of art. Um, you know, we have a trading platform and we're looking at how NFTs can have utility within an ecosystem or within a product and, uh, and what that could mean. So the world of NFTs is definitely going to evolve and change, but it's just so much you know, excitement around it and growth around it. Um, it's fascinating to see. Do you think NFTs can create more equitable markets? Ah, really important question. Absolutely. Uh, and we're already seeing it, right? I mean, a creator can be anywhere. And, and look, all the lockdowns related to COVID taught us about work from anywhere and produce from anywhere. Uh, and the digital world allows that and enables that. And we've had lots of tools that have, have been created uh, to facilitate that. But what I think NFTs does is it, again, allows a creator to own that asset and own the rights to that asset over longer periods of time and to program in a way to get a long tail stream of value, uh, either a, a, an artist, right, from every time his song, his or her song is played, uh, the writer, right, who have been long kind of, I won't say robbed, but, but not paid equitably for their contribution to, to music can, can now have a, a royalty stream in the future. So I, I do think that it, it pushes the sharing down to the decentralized masses. And I think that's the, the whole nature of decentralized versus centralized. Centralized, the whole world has been centralized for years. It's been hierarchical structures trying to leverage the brain of the CEO and all the wealth pushes up. So why, why does the CEO make 460 times more than the laborers, which are producing the value that the CEO is taking through stock options and all the accounting gimmickry that goes on? So decentralization democratizes value and it gives everyone a chance to be part of a community, to be part of an ecosystem and to share in the, the spoils of that labor. And yeah, again, uh, Axie Infinity to me is a, is a great example, uh, not an NFT per se, but the idea of a digital asset that is scarce, that uh, in this play to earn economy, instead of a centralized authority taking all the wealth, uh, the owners of the axes can share in that wealth. And so you have stories of, you know, migrant laborers in the Philippines who were making, you know, pennies an hour, uh, now making thousands of dollars a month, their life is better for this community participation. And you think if that person then feels comfortable having uh, a life where they can spend more time being creative, they can enter the NFT economy and create things of value that can be shared uh, across the whole ecosystem. So I do think it, it pushes the ownership of, va of creativity or the value that we all create every day, right? Our whole life is about converting energy to value. We get up in the morning, we fuel our bodies, we try to be creative or innovative or productive, whether we're making widgets, whether we're pushing around paper, or whether we're you know, moving around financial assets or, or physical assets. It's about converting energy to value. And now there is a way to monetize that conversion of energy to value in the digital property rights world or the NFT world. Can you explain in like simple terms, what does is, what is the ownership economy really mean? So I think the ownership economy is a paradigm shift from what we had had before. Um, you know, previously uh, we had centralized servers that would hold digital assets for people, and uh, you know they were never able to truly own those assets, and those assets were locked into those servers and those environments. It was very hard to interoperate whatever that asset is with. Uh, another system, another game, another financial institution. Um, and with ownership economy, um, people have true ownership of these digital assets, whether they're you know, financial instruments or a skin inside of a game or um, you know, a title to a home. 
and marketplaces now exist and will continue to exist and grow for people to exchange those assets and create economies around these digital items. And uh, that's something that we've never had before. It's always required an intermediary to exist, to be able to say, okay, we're going to do the swap for you between this person and this person or this organization and this organization. We're going to take uh, a fee for doing it. And oh, by the way, um, if we decide we don't want it to happen, we can stop that from happening. And so I think people have a greater degree of autonomy to act independently and to trust each other with uh, this ownership economy that's starting to blossom. Why do NFTs matter? Yeah, well, I would say if, you know, if DeFi is there to attract yields and large amounts of capital, especially institutional capital, um, then NFTs are there to attract you know, culture. And um, essentially what's happening is you have all these artists who are being paid far more than they've been paid in the Web 2.0 world in some cases. And so you have this massive attraction of, of people building and creating these new sort of project NFTs and it's attracting you know, people who would not traditionally be into crypto and they simply want to be part of uh, whatever their favorite artist or something they think is cool. And it's, it's really a way to culturally express crypto to people who were not interested on the financial aspects of it. Well, I, I think it, it's kind of unclear to me whether they will matter in the long run, which I think maybe is a little uh, controversial. But I, I think as long as we have communities that are rallying around kind of mental conceptual artifacts, there will be people that want to kind of stamp their name on that, that artifact. And you know, once it's kind of clear once you go from there that they're going to have some value and they're going to be traded in some way as long as those are the values the community has. So NFTs matter for us and for the market for a couple of reasons, right? They've certainly surprised us enormously by the incredible speed which they've taken off. But what was really interesting is we got involved in NFTs early on because we thought they were going to be important for industrial applications. And we've been working on NFTs for a long time. And we're like, we're suddenly blown away by how quickly they took off from an art and a collectible standpoint. But now also, after a slow start, we're seeing NFTs really take off in the industrial space. So we got one of our clients, Peroni Beer in Italy, and we issue a new NFT for every single batch of beer, right? So it enables traceability. And that's one NFT per batch of beer. So it just shows you the history of that NFT. But the next thing we're on to now is we've got another client that's not public yet. They're issuing 60,000 NFTs a day one for every single package of their pharmaceutical product that's, being come, that's come out. And they're using it not only for traceability, but they're headed towards a model where they're gonna use it for operations. So they're gonna have inventory management, they're gonna have replenishment, they're gonna be able to understand where their stuff is in the supply chain as well. Can you break down what are the different categories of NFTs? I mean, uh, I think NFTs are eating the world. There are so many different categories. Uh, there's a huge gaming sec uh, sector that is just getting more and more popular. Uh, there's a huge collectible sector. Uh, there's going to be furniture. There's going to be metaverses in which you can buy NFTs that are houses. I think the possibilities are really limitless. Uh, for me and for Tier Lab, we're personally most focused on NFTs in terms of art and what this means for the future of innovative uh, art for the new generation. So, uh, like from like uh, like collectibles, artwork, gaming, DeFi kind of standpoint. Yeah, you can answer it however you want. Yeah, um, I would say the the main ones that I'm seeing right now are like the utility community access tokens. Um, there's obviously events and ticketing. Um, I've seen some stuff doing like AR augmented reality, kind of like bridging the real world and digital world. Um, also bridging the digital and uh, physical world are like certificates of authenticity. Um, and that's something that's been around in blockchain in art for like the last couple of years, even on the blockchain or, or on the Bitcoin blockchain. Um, so authenticity is another big one. Um, DeFi is obviously like really interesting. Um, like fractionalizing NFTs, just don't do it in the US. Um, and then obviously the art, uh, pretty self-explanatory. Collectibles, I think is gonna be a big one as brands kind of enter the space. Music and music rights. Uh, I think a lot of people are trying to figure that out right now. A um, lot of legal loopholes and frameworks to like create for that. Um, but that's promising as well. 
Um, and yeah, gaming in the metaverse, I would say, is also super, super interesting. I think it's probably going to be one of the next big things uh, in the NFT space. Um, but I think we're still a couple years away from that hitting full force. But I, I firmly believe like in two, three years, the next big NFT rush is going to be centered around gaming and metaverse kind of stuff. Do you think NFTs are a sustainable path uh, for supporting longtime content creators or is this going to go back to the 1%? I mean, I don't see any reason why it wouldn't support, you know, long t everybody, right, that's getting involved. I mean, we're seeing news of um, teenagers launching NFTs and, and making a, a, a splash, right? So typically when you look at um, the blockchain technology or cryptocurrencies, they, they get rid of the middlemen, right? They make it more efficient, they make it faster. And so there's no reason why that should accumulate all to the 1% of uh, content or art creators. I think there will be a room for everyone to get involved. And that's the power of decentralization, right? So someone sitting in New York has the same access as someone sitting in Bangladesh, let's say, right? So like it really opens up the world to everyone. And, um, and that's what excites me the most about just decentralization in general on the finance side, on the NFT side, we'll see participation globally in this, in this economy. Where do you see a lot of the value of NFTs derived from? It uh, depends, depends on the use case. And uh, definitely for different use cases, different. And a lot of current like state of the market. So people, uh, for, for, for us specifically, there is a value just in terms of like collect, collection in this. So aesthetical um, beauty or something. So a lot of guys just buying things because they looks pretty well, they liked it. Like when you're buying a picture, like uh, for home. But then for profile pictures, it mostly it's kind of being in some community. So if you have board apes, so you're in the board ape community, like CryptoPunk, you like OG and CryptoPunk community. So this um, 10K collections, they actually form the community around and it's like a ticket to be in this community. So this is the value comes from. Uh, oh, and also you can resell it <laughs> at some point. Um, and usually prices goes up because it's like limited. So yeah, it's different for different type of NFTs. The value right now is really interesting to follow. I th right now, you're seeing a ton of different projects come in and deploy. And I think because of the buzz that surrounds the whole space, it usually can pick up value. Um, the one thing that makes NFTs a little bit different than perhaps fungible tokens is it's technically less liquid because you have different unique assets. And so that's kind of what has made it hard to track. All right, well, with fungible tokens, you can see, all right, well, if, if there's a lot of hype, then it'll go quickly up. And then if there's less hype or people are a little bit fr afraid of its future outcomes, then you're going to have a lot of, um, of dumping, I guess, I guess, as well, when it comes to value values. So right now, I think people are kind of just picking their tribes, if you will, and putting um, their money into those projects. And that's why you have probably like 10,000 different uh, profile picture drops. I personally don't know if that's terribly sustainable long term. What I say with probably most things is the ones that have resiliency from a brand perspective, maybe who's on the cap table or who's part of that community, all these things that relate to regular investment strategies, I think that's what's going to bring forth the really strong projects. And of course, the ones that um, don't really innovate beyond the, the batch or the, the kind of average set selection set might, um, might die out in the long term. I think scarcity, right? The idea of creating a unique asset in the digital world is invaluable. And you know, Eric Schmidt said it best, I think he said, look, what Satoshi Nakamoto, whoever he, she, they are, did is amazing. Creating Bitcoin is amazing. But what they really did is create this idea of a scarce asset in the digital world. He said a lot of big businesses are gonna be built around that. So the idea of true scarcity in the digital world is, is a critically important element uh, and a lot of value will accrete to that. I also think the idea of programmability uh, of, of an asset is, is a huge value driver. And then ultimately, 
the uh, establishment of, of provenance, right? We know the history of an asset. We know the ownership of, of that asset. Uh, I think there's, there's a lot of value that will accrete to that. So ultimately, it's making value two-dimensional or, or two-directional. Uh, whereas you know, the internet made information bidirectional, the trust net, as I like to call it, or the world of tokenization uh, makes value bidirectional. And the use cases are mind boggling because property rights globally are so much bigger than media and commerce. It's, it's everything. Right now, what do you envision as the most disruptive use cases uh, for NFTs right now? I mean, right now we're seeing, um, you know, so, so the non-fungible quality of a token lends itself to certain use cases that can create um, digital scarcity. And so there is immediate, quite radical use cases within the digital goods economy, be it gaming or um, metaverse or digital collectibles. Um, so we are seeing that happen today and that's great because it's bringing about this technology to mainstream adoption, to pop culture, and that helps in the, the broader adoption and accessibility of this, um, uh, this technology overall. Um, what I find super interesting is um, being able to solve for digital identity in a way that doesn't have to involve intermediaries um, and therefore bring about access and um, lower costs for just generally anything, any use case within um, uh, blockchain based technologies. So things like why is it that as a retail person I have to have access to certain digital goods at a premium compared to an institution um, and, and, and many times that's a function of the cost of ascertaining identity, the cost of um, thinking about distribution. All of that now tends to zero in terms of fees when you now have this ability to ascertain identity at a, um, at a programmatic level. So you move from a subjective based trust paradigm to a mathematical one. And I think that in, is very cool and can bring about just overall, um, just an overall increase in adoption, increase in access to whatever use cases you can expect to see on blockchain. Yeah, so we have all these different types of NFTs in the market. In your perspective, where do you think most of the value of those NFTs uh, derive from? So, um, so there's, well, you could, you could think of that in a couple of ways, right? So there's the price action, and there is the value that accrues from the secondary market transfer of this asset, be it a copyright, or be it a digital good, or just a um, proof of provenance. And you're seeing a lot of the price action be reflected in the secondary market transfers. Um, there's another way to think about value creation, and it's about how do you create new paradigms of um, digital goods? How do you enable uh, digital scarcity? And how do you enable um, a new content medium in itself? So, you know, at Consensus, we're speaking to many companies that have a lifestyle presence, have a brand value, and are thinking of this as an entirely different content creation medium itself. So I think this can really open up all kinds of dimensions in how you think about content, content creation, content, cre content transfer, copyright issues. Um, I don't know if that quite answers your question, but I, I like to separate out price action to sort of product value, if you will. I think that what has been diminished in the market is the value of art and storytelling. Uh, I actually love that question. Thank you for asking that. I think what's what people have been very focused on within the NFT market is obviously utility, which is very interesting and necessary to a certain extent, right? To create communities, you have to have some sort of events or some sort of ties that keep people from coming back instead of just something being a simple product. 
And uh, having said that, I think there's a lot of misplacement on the value of the art being tied to the utility and not the artist or their artworks. So like, for example, uh, for Tyler Hobbs, you know, he's created the amazing Fidenza series, but more people know about Fidenza and the price point that they've sold than Tyler Hobbs in his story. And I feel like that's, as a traditional art collector and lover myself, that's really disappointing to me because I think the focus when you're thinking about supporting and buying artwork should not just be on how much is this, how much am I, am I going to be able to flip this for in a month? It should be on, you know, I love this artist. I see him or her place in my collection as such. And I think this work that they did is particularly important because of X. And I think that's something that because the market moves so quickly that people kind of fall behind on. But one thing that Tier Lab is very focused on is that value of art. And I think that this is the only way to, uh, for these blue chip, uh, high quality art pieces to last long term, instead of you know something that can be very hyped up by the market to have everyone involved uh, and then people to quickly lose interest. If I had to use a metaphor, and this is something kind of silly, but I say to my team quite often, I we want to be a tree that slowly grows. You know, at in the beginning, it might take a while for us to have enough shade in order to be able to expand. But we don't want to be a thunderstorm where everyone knows about us, but we're gone within a few hours with the, without really leaving a trace. And to answer that question in another aspect, I think something that's been lacking in this space is curation. I think it's getting harder and harder for people to come on to platforms uh, because at plat as platforms are figuring out ways to monetize and have a more of a volume play, they need to have more artists come on, they need to have more drops. And so it's becoming harder for artists, uh, sorry, it's becoming harder for collectors to learn about what artists they should collect, the stories behind the artists themselves and the artworks. And that's something that we at TR Lab really wanna focus on. For AI 2041, uh, we've been really working with Ronnie Pervino, who's a curator who's also worked with Christie's to help us put together how the different artists in our series match with each other and with all the different topics related to AI that they're exploring, what does this mean for the overall series and the curational uh, value there? Ultimately, I think I came into the NFT space because I love storytelling and I think NFTs have offered a completely new way to storytell. And I don't want people to forget that, you know, there's value in beautiful stories that's not just related to a piece of the story, which would be utility. Yeah, generative art is still, is still pretty new and people are still getting used to digital art, as you said. Can you break down the differences between uh, generative art and the utility of other NFTs? Yeah, for sure. I, I mean, uh, there are so many different types of NFTs. There's collectibles, there are communities that are very focused around the roadmap, right? So it's about, giving back to the community. It's about things on top of the art. And so it can include, you know, in-person events, uh, you know, this entire NFT week, there have been so many crazy events uh, and concerts and DJs performing for various communities. There's also other uh, utility that, that's usually included that helps a collector appreciate the value of uh, the works that they've collected. And so the idea is about supporting each other in the community and then coming together to continue building on the roadmap. The other types of utility that I'd see, it's more related to a symbol where um, CryptoPunks, for example, I mean, uh, everyone talks about CryptoPunks, but it's really, I think, something that's become a part of the entire crypto ethos. I think it's become a symbol where I think, you know, if CryptoPunks dies or if it goes away, then the entire NFT space is going to go away. It's really the belief of everyone in the entire space that's, I feel like, has been cemented by this one uh, incredible project. On the other hand, what we've been seeing, you know, with art blocks, with Nifty Gateway, there's been a lot of innovative different drop mechanics where now a lot of artists such as Nest Graphics, they're having collector keys where you can only uh, you can you're only able to collect their new works if you own one of their old works. So there's a lot of the idea of what it means to reward their old collectors in ways more than just you know providing private AMAs or conversations or quick answers on Discord. And uh, so to me, what's most fascinating about that uh, is 
how people, how different people have taken what it means to be an artist in the digital space and what it means in terms of what collectors are looking for, for engagement uh, of how to really satisfy these collectors that in an entirely different new way, it's like 24 seven. Some people can, can buy CryptoPunk, some can't, or what, whatever the, whatever the, um, the NFT is. How do you view uh, fractionalization versus buying the whole thing? And you know, is that inclusive, right, for others to to, to get involved? Yes. So uh, to mention something, so uh, let me give you a thought on something adjacent, and then I'll give you my thought on that because it's very relevant, I think. Which is how do we? Does ownership in a community have to do with your role in the community in terms of how you are serving the community, or in terms of like how much you are willing to acquire an asset in the community? Uh, and one thing I'm very interested in that perspective is non-tradable NFTs that I'm used to kind of designate that I have a certain role or a certain hat I'm wearing in the community. I'm very excited about that. I think, and those wouldn't have monetary value because they're non-tradable, which is also interesting. I think that as it comes to fractionalization, this is also a path to being able to kind of have a wider set of declaration over something that a lot of people find valuable, which I think is probably where it's going to go. It's probably going to be uh, more and more rare that someone has a whole crypto punk and maybe in the future I don't know or maybe people will be like oh I want a whole crypto punk that's that's my identity I'm not giving that away so I don't think it'll play out both ways basically I guess it's gonna come down to the individual or, or group or whoever that uh, finds value in it and depending on what that is for them to to go all in or, or to buy a piece of it and just be a part of it yeah one of the other things that we've been chatting about during this conference too is you know not only the ownership of an nft but being able to transfer that asset across chain so like interoperability like how important is this how is it how important is it for the space to be multi-chain in order to swap assets around and kind of and the second part of that is going to be like around DeFi, right being able to kind of buy sell and trade these there's two ways i think about it one is technically i think technically at the moment at least it's extremely important we haven't seen like the the uber chain yet that that will not that will no longer necessitate multi-chain world. I think it's, that's a thing technically that we need. So it's kind of done there. I think as well, there's a kind of a community aspect to it where there's communities on all these different platforms now, Ethereum, whatever, there's all these different platforms, they all have different communities. And those different communities are going to want to get involved in these different NFTs. And I think there can be NFTs, for example, that are very, that don't live in a particular chain, they live across communities. So there's a meta community that doesn't care whether you're on ETH, Solana, or whatever. Um, and that can be, I think, part of the direction that we go. Yeah, I mean, you guys were early on on the NFT front. Um, CryptoKitties came out. There's other some booms around there, around ICOs, right? This is early 2017. Yep. Um, but yeah, for you guys to have the vision to think about nfts as a uh, digital representation some ownership in this metaverse metaverse which is a big word um and then also gaming which it's coming back around and we'll we'll touch all this as, as, we, as we discuss more but what was the vision there on the nft front so uh i've been very early in major technology revolutions and and you know early in the internet early in online video early in mobile and once we started to tune in to the possibilities of NFTs, you know, ERC-721 assets, digitally unique, uh, composable, programmable, we just found that super inspiring. Like there's a whole universe of new things that we could do and we started to experiment with them. You know, this is early days for Ethereum yeah. and uh, early, it was during the ICO boom, it was sort of frothy at the time. Uh, we're software developers, we're pretty heads down uh, building stuff and we just thought, there's a whole bunch of interesting possibilities. We were really focused on the collectibles market back then, um, which was prescient, but three years ahead of its time, right? Um, and so uh, it was just a really a fun time to be doing brand new stuff. It was also super challenging. Nobody knew how to build this stuff. There were a few experts to go to. Um, and there were people doing crypto gaming conferences and things like that. It was, it was a heady time, but it feels quaint compared to how it is today. 